This is the first of two short lectures in chapter 35 dealing with light and geometric optics. First of all, there have been several attempts in history to measure the speed of light. Uh, one of the first is um, a attempt by Galileo, and here was the general setup. He had two lanterns separated by 10 kilometers, and the possessor of the first lantern would have it covered, and then at a specified time, they would start the time, he would, he would release, he or she would release the lantern, uh, exposing it so that the second observer 10 kilometers away would see that light. As soon as they saw the light, they would reveal their lantern, and so their light would come back to the first observer, and the first observer would see that light and then stop the clock. So basically, first light's revealed, second light comes back, stop the clock, and you're measuring how fast the signal passes there and back again uh, 20 kilometers. Now, of course, there's reaction time involved here, so you would have to account for the human reaction time, maybe measure that somehow, and subtract that, and make that calculation. And based on all that, Galileo came up with a speed of light of 3 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Not bad, but um, more than a, a thousand off and as far as a factor of a thousand off. So not good as far as we know, but not bad as far as realizing that the speed of light is really, really fast. Here's a, another measurement made uh, later, um, uh, not too long after uh, Galileo's death. Um, involving the uh, planet Jupiter and one of its Galilean moons, Io. Uh, Jupiter has four Galilean moons, and the closest moon, Io, is going around Jupiter uh, with a period of about one and three quarters days, 1.75 days. So if you're measuring that period of, of the uh, orbit of Io around Jupiter, you would find that over the course of a year, there would be discrepancies in that measurement of that period. For instance, since we know that the Earth is going around the Sun at 30,000 meters per second, if you were measuring this orbit of Io around Jupiter over the course of one and three quarters days, if Earth was on the uh, side of the Sun like this and moving away, well, either toward or away, if we're moving away at 30,000 meters per second, then over the course of a day and three quarters, it could move a pretty good distance, and even light would have to travel that extra distance to get to, to your eye. And on the other hand, on the other side of the sun, when Earth was traveling towards Jupiter at 30,000 meters per second, it could actually shorten the distance between Earth and Jupiter, and, and in essence, over the course of one and three quarters days, shorten the measured period of Io going around Jupiter. So there'd be a discrepancy um, separated by six months in the orbit of Earth around the Sun where the period measured for Io would either lengthen or shorten. And if you use some good geometry and some good calculations, you could actually come up with the speed of light for, um, with, this, with this information. And that's what uh, Ole Raymer did in 1676, and Raymer came up with the speed of light of 2.3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Really not bad. This is really the very first good measurement of the speed of light. It's on the order of the speed of light that we know of today, and um, an excellent, brilliant idea um, based on uh, the measurement of the moon going around Jupiter. Here's a more accurate setup by Fizeau and Foucault. Um, they did it several times and then several variations of this basic, same basic idea. But here you have a tooth wheel, which you can vary the, uh, the speed of this wheel. You have light going through the gap of the wheel, and it's reflecting off a mirror at some distance d, and it comes back towards your eye. Now, if you increase the speed of the wheel, there will be some point where you get to removing the wheel so fast 
the light will go through the gap and on its way back it's going to hit one of these tooths on the way back and hence get blocked. So you increase the speed of the wheel to the point where you don't see the light and at the moment you know that it's just going there and just barely getting blocked on the way back. Well, if you know the spacing of the teeth of this wheel and you know how fast you're turning the wheel, you can calculate the time it takes for it to travel that little bit of angle between a gap and, and the next tooth of the wheel. So you can calculate the time it took for the light to go there and back again. And if you take that distance there and back again, divide by that time, you can get a pretty good value for the speed of light. And based on this measurement, for the round trip time, twice that distance uh, to the mirror, they came up with a value for the speed of light of 3.1 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Very close to the known value today of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So excellent experimental apparatus. They did this for many times over the years and uh, modified their apparatus to make it even more accurate. 3.1 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So here's a, a list of many of the measurements of the speed of light. Uh, the first one, Galileo Galilei, you know, 3 times 10 to the 5 meters per second or 333 kilometers per second. Um, excellent start, but uh, Ole Raymer came up with a better measurement. And then, of course, we got James Bradley based on stellar aberration. The rotating mirror and rotating wheel of Fizeau and Foucault. James Clerk Maxwell, theoretical calculations in 1868, came up with a value very close to 3 times 10 to the 8, you know, 284,000 kilometers per second. Uh, Michelson and Morley, rotating mirror, okay, start really zeroing in on this final value of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, so excellent. Really, um, how hard could this measurement be? I mean, you're just talking about light and traveling a distance and measuring that. I mean, I got light here and I got a stopwatch. Let's just see how fast I can measure the speed of light. So we got a light and a stopwatch and... All right, so I got a measurement here of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. And that was about half a meter. So if I take uh, half a meter divided by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 9, I get 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's it. You know, just a light and a stopwatch, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm so proud of that. I'm going to put my name on this list. So in 2000, umpteen. Uh, John Goldman stopwatch and flashlight 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Here's a brief history of light. 1000 AD, it was proposed that light consisted of tiny particles, just real tiny particles traveling from me to you and you to me. Newton uses this particle model to explain reflection and refraction. And he predicted that the particles would move faster in the liquid because um, the atoms of the, or we're really talking about atoms, but the particles in the liquid would use their gravity and pull the light forward. This is probably the one of the very few places where Newton was actually wrong. I mean, he was right and brilliant about uh, assuming the particle model of light because certainly light can be assumed in that uh, frame of reference as a particle model of light. But uh, he was wrong about the fact that uh, light would move faster in the liquid where it actually moves slower. So one of the very few points where the brilliant Newton was actually, actually wrong. Huygens um, in 1678 assumed a wave model of light and was able to explain many of the properties of light um, using this wave-like nature of light. Young showed in 1801 strong support for this wave theory 
by showing that light exhibited interference. Very, very good, because that's something that you would not see with particles, interference. Particles couldn't interfere in the way that he was showing the um, constructive and destructive interference. Long came old in 1802, who showed that the wave theory was not only for the young. Now, I'm just trying to see if you're paying attention, because we're going through history here, and sometimes history can get boring, so we'll block that out. Maxwell, 1865. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, and he showed it theoretically. Very good. Particle support. Uh, Max Planck um, showed that electromagnetic radiation is quantized. This implies bundles of energy called uh, photons and particles. Actually, they didn't call it photons then. Uh, this helped to explain the light spectrum emitted by hot objects. Einstein expanded this to light and said that light could be, um, could be thought of as being comprised of these particles, which he called photons. And this helped him explain the photoelectric effect, which was one of his famous papers in 1905. He had four monstrous papers in 1905. Uh, the photoelectric effect, uh, Brownian motion, and two papers on special relativity. Probably 1905, the greatest year any scientist ever had, was these four papers by Einstein. He got the Nobel Prize for explaining this photoelectric effect. So if you treat light as a particle, particles of light are called photons. Each photon has a particular energy. The energy is equal to some constant times the frequency of the light. And that constant was determined to be Planck's constant, coincidentally. The value of that constant is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Actually, in a sense, this E equals some constant times frequency encompasses both natures of lights because it's treating light as bundles of energy, discrete bundles of energy, uh, um, each of them going as this constant goes. And also, frequency is something we associate with the na wave nature of light. So it interacts like a particle, but it has a given frequency like a wave. And so this equation this photon equation really encompasses two natures of light. The light does have a dual nature, and experiments can be devised that would display either the wave nature of light or the particle nature of light. Some experiments, light acts like a wave, and in others, it acts like a particle. If you devise your experiment, to look for light as a wave, you will find it as a wave. If you devise your experiment to look for light as a particle, you will find it as a particle. Nature prevents testing both qualities at the same time. You can't find a wave and particle nature at the same time. It depends on what you're looking for, and you can only look for one at one time. So whatever you're looking for with light, you're going to find it. So this brings us to geometric optics. And to understand this, we're going to use the ray approximation. The ray approximation, the rays are arrows that show the direction that the light is going. But we're going to, in this approximation, we're thinking of the light as being of wave nature. And so it's got waves like this, and so it has wave fronts, maxima, as it's moving along in this direction. So we have these wave fronts that are separate by wavelengths as they're moving along in some particular direction given by the arrow of the ray. If we have reflection of light, the incident ray, which would be the first arrow, will travel in some medium. When it encounters a boundary with a second medium, part of that incident ray will be reflected back into the first medium. This is what we define as the reflection of light, where the first ray hits a boundary and then there's a second ray, at least part of part of that 
is going to be going back into that first medium. We define specular reflection as something that looks like this. Reflection from a smooth surface. The reflected rays are parallel to each other. So if you had different rays coming in, indicating the direction of light coming in, and it comes out, all those reflected rays are indeed parallel to each other. All reflection in this course that we're going to look at regarding the nature of light is going to be assumed to be specular reflection. You could have diffuse reflection. Let's say that the surface is not so smooth, it's kind of rough, and the rays come in and they reflect, but because of the rough surface, the reflection, reflected rays are going off in all directions, so they're not parallel when they come off. So they can go off in all directions, and that most likely that those rays can possibly make it to your eye. So diffuse reflection is from a rough surface. The reflected rays travel in a variety of directions, and this kind of makes uh, things easier to see. You know, if you had a dry road and you had uh, diffuse reflection, the light will go off in all directions, and presumably some of that light will make it to your eye so you can actually see what's going on there. As opposed to specular reflection off a wet road, where the light could just reflect off in some direction, never make it to your eye, and hence you can't see the road. Here's an example of a wet road and it's very bright in some spots where you really can't see what's there on the road because the light that's hitting that, that point is not actually making it to your eye. It's just kind of reflecting off, going purely off in some direction, and that direction, unfortunately, is not towards your eye. As opposed to a dry road where you can pretty much see every bit of the road. And in fact, here's a picture of this particular road in, in its dry sense, and I have another picture when it's wet, and you can see clearly the difference where when it's wet, you can't see the road. So here's the, here's the, yeah, here's the same road when it's wet, and obviously you, you just can't see the road. Because it's wet. Here's the moon. The moon is a good example of specular reflection and diffuse reflection. There are parts of the moon where there were ancient lava flows, which we call the, um, um, the maria. And those areas are, even though the, the, the volcanic rock is kind of dark as well, but those areas are very smooth as opposed to the more cratered zones where there's been a lot of material thrown up and you have rocks everywhere and it's kind of more diffuse reflection. So the black areas of the moon are the specular reflected areas and the white areas are, are the diffuse reflected areas. Really a lot of the rocks aren't that much different. But if you had a specular reflection on the moon, it kind of goes off, light comes in and goes off in some particular direction and maybe that light doesn't make it back to your eye. So that area, even though it might not be particularly black, will appear black to you because you're not getting that light back, as opposed to the more diffuse areas where you have these craters where there's much more reflection in all directions, and some of that light makes it back to you so you can actually see those areas uh, more clearly. Really, this effect is what we, uh, we account for what we say is the man and the moon. And, you know, if you look for the man and moon on the web and try to get somebody to explain what it is, nobody really explains what the man and the moon is. So I'm going to show you what I think the man and the moon is. We're looking at the moon here, and we're looking for some features that will show us the face and the moon. Here's the mouth. Here's one eye. Here's another eye, a nose, and the ear. And there you've got the man and the moon. You know, you could just as easily say there's a dog in the moon. You know, you're looking at this picture of the moon, and it looks to me, you know, if you look over here, it looks like there's a face and two ears and then a body off, you know, you see, it looks like a face of a dog right there. 
Huh? Huh? Looks like a dog. Some people even say there's a rabbit in the moon. If you look at this picture of the moon, just a little bit of uh, imagination, you could draw a rabbit in the moon, you know, with rabbit ears. Of course, if you're drawing like that, you know, it kind of looks like one of my drawings. And I would actually say that's not a rabbit. That's more like um, like a duck. You know, if you remember my physics two duck, you know, which I drew with a cursor in about three seconds, it still still lives on, and it kind of looks like this um, this image in the moon. So that's the duck in the moon. All right, back to uh, reflection, Affleck. Yeah, Well, we have uh, specular reflection. And if we define what we call a normal, which is perpendicular to the surface of the boundary, perpendicular 90 degree angle, that normal line is how we're going to define our angle of incidence and our angle of reflection. So the angle going in, that angle between the ray going in and the normal is our angle of incidence. And the angle coming out, the ray going out, that with the normal is our angle of reflection. And it turns out that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection for specular reflection. So we would say theta incident is equal to theta reflected. That's the law of reflection. Example of this would take place again with the moon. Uh, one one proof that we actually did go to the moon, you know, apart from any conspiracy theories to the contrary, is that um, the Apollo 11 astronauts placed a retro reflector on the moon. So if you had a good laser and you found that retro reflector, you could shoot your laser at that reflector, it would come right back to you, and you could measure that intensity coming back to you. And that would be proof that we actually went to the moon because there's no way that anything else on the moon would be able to reflect that way. You would need, you, it would have to be that we actually place something there. So that's proof that we went to the moon. There was an episode on uh, Big Bang Theory that actually illustrate that as well. Here's what a retro reflector would look like. It's actually uh, kind of the, the corner of a cube. And as the laser light comes in, it does a angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, a pure reflection there, but it does it three times off the three sides of this corner of this cube, and eventually it just comes back out parallel the way it came in. And hence, it could come right back to you, and you can measure that, that light as it comes back. Same kind of principle works with a reflector off the um, rear of a, of a car. Um, it doesn't have light itself, but it uses your light going into that and coming right back to you so that you can actually see that reflected light and realize that the, the car is there. Another application of reflectors is DMD mirrors that might be used, say, for a projection in a movie theater. Each mirror of this DMD uh, design corresponds to a pixel in an image that you're trying to create. When it is on, it is tilted to reflect onto a screen, and when it's off, it is tilted to reflect away using specular reflection. So you can start creating your pixel image on the screen. The time it's on or off will give you intensity, and there's one array for red, and one array for green, and one array for blue. So you can actually create a color image of pixelated pixels on your, on your screen using reflection of all these little mirrors. Kind of a um, very interesting device, a nice way to recreate an image onto a large external screen. That concludes our first short lecture, chapter 35, dealing with geometric optics.